Excellent. So uh, we've got all of our technical stuff set up, and uh, hopefully uh, everything is ready and going. So we can now present our final speaker for the first day, uh, Mike Schuster. Uh, so your applause for Mike Schuster, please. So j just imagine, uh, right now it's uh, more than 7 p.m. here in Moscow, and Mike uh, hopefully recently woke up, and it's, uh, uh, what, what's the time, 8 a.m. in California, right? Yes, it's 8 a.m. Yeah, so uh, straight around the globe uh, is right now connected to our event. Uh, by the way, I hope that... Uh, I would be able to show the uh, auditory to Mike without breaking all the stuff here because we've got a hell lot of uh, different plugs and wires. Um, actually, we met Mike uh, uh, last year at NIPS uh, when uh, the famous and glorious Jeff Dean introduced Mike to us. And uh, this talk would be about uh, uh, machine learning behind Google Translate. Uh, wait a sec, uh, Mike, what, just one moment. Maybe we would be able to show you the... The room, the, okay. the public, yep, the room. So it's been done really carefully. Here you can see yourself on a 10 meter wide screen. And slowly yeah. but surely, we're trying to... Wow. ...come up with the audience. Yep. Hello. <laughs> Okay, okay, so hopefully I've introduced Mike and we can move on and uh, I will completely uh, give uh, the, all, all the audience to you, Mike. So okay. here you go. Great. So thank you very much. Um, I'm, um, I'm really happy I can present this to you. I would like, would have liked actually to come and see you, but um, that wasn't possible. So we have to do it via video. But this is 2017, and um, hopefully this will work. So let me turn on my slides. Uh, uh, okay, everything's working correctly again. Okay, so let's see whether this works. Um, Mike Schuster. Mike Schuster. Vzuch. Okay, yeah, we see the slides. You see the slides, okay. Yeah. Cool. Neural so, machine okay. translation and other AI projects at Google. Yes, okay. So uh, I will be talking about the machine translation project um, that we did at Google and maybe a little bit about a few other ones. Uh, so I was the person uh, running the project and um, we did a lot of uh, work for it. We programmed almost all of it. Um, of course, in the end, a lot, of, lot more people were involved. So this was this, what this was, was that we, um, we rewrote Google Translate, it made it much better. And this, I'm, in this talk, I will tell you what actually happened. So, um, but yes. So, um, first of all, at Google, we have for years now been uh, doing deep learning. And uh, since 2012, when the group was formed, we, um, we are using more and more uh, deep learning at Google. And here you see a graph of all the model directories that contain um, code with deep learning at Google. So you see this is an exponential curve almost. And uh, lately in, in Q4 2016, we had 4,000 directories at Google. So meaning at least 4,000 people working on things that uh, touch deep learning. And this is across many products, Android, apps, Gmail, image understanding, maps, NLP, photos, speech, translation, YouTube, and many, many, many more. So just about this talk here, I will give you a quick history of the machine translation uh, at Google. 
Then I will tell you about the current production status. And then we'll go into the details of uh, sequence models and sequence to sequence models because those are the, the basis for uh, the translation system. Then I'll tell you some details about the new translation system, which is which we call brain neural machine translation system. I'll tell you a little bit about the architecture and training, the segmentation model, the TPU and quantization that we use. Then um, we have some new things, which we call multilingual models, which are very interesting. We have, um, and finally, I'll tell you about challenges and research problems we are working on and resources in case uh, you want to do some of this yourself. So first, a quick research history of this project at Google. So many people try to improve translation with neural networks. Um, Google Translate has always been a quite good system in the uh, Translate community, but um, in many languages it wasn't that good. Uh, for example, in Russian it's not very good yet. In Russian to English or English to Russian, the system that is out there right now is not uh, very good, but it's still a lot better than some other systems that you can find. So. We from the brain team and the people from the Google Translate team tried to use neural networks many times in the past, but did not succeed. So what happened then was that in NIPS 2014, so basically just two years ago, a paper came out which showed that you can do neural translation just with a neural network by using sequence to sequence models. And those were people actually here at Google who had uh, built a system on a research database, it's called WMT, which has like uh, 12 million sentence pairs. And they showed that on the direction from English to French, they got very good results. In, in fact, state of the art results. The problem was that it was took a very long time to train. Um, but the nice part about this system was that you could do translation without explicit alignment of the source sentence and the target sentence, meaning you did not need to know which word mapped to what word on the output side. Um, I will go in more, more into details uh, on later slides, but one problem with that paper was that all information from the encoder needed to be carried in the internal state, which breaks down for very long sentences. And this was a basic problem that uh, they got somewhat around with a, with a specific trick, but, um, and we'll explain this in more detail later, but this was one issue with that system. But what happened also was that very um, roughly at the same time, another paper came out, which um, is called attention models for translation. And with this paper, this drawback was gone. So um, the, the advantage was that it gave access to all the encoder states, and basically that meant that the translation quality was then independent of the sentence spec. And we'll go into these details uh, later in the talk. This is just a quick history. Okay, so um, just to show you what the development timeline at Google was, in September 2015, three of us in the brain team started to use TensorFlow to develop a translation model. And then in uh, about January 2016, so just like four months, three to four months later, we had uh, state-of-the-art results on this small, relatively small WMT benchmark database. And that gave us a lot of confidence that this would work also for much, much larger databases like for the Google Translate data, which is about 100 to 1,000 times more data than the WMT database. So then in um, February 2016, we actually got our first production data results. And then um, a lot more people from our team, from the brain team and from the Translate team, got involved to uh, productionize NMT meaning to make it ready such that it can be launched and the whole world can use it. So then in um, 
September 2016, we launched our first lang language, Chinese to English, and put out a, a full system description um, on a, with a paper up on archive. And uh, we also have a blog post about that. So then in mid-November 2016, so just a few months ago, we had launched 16 language pairs, which um, is English to Japanese, Korean, Chinese, Turkish, Spanish, Portuguese, German, and French, to and from English. And they were all launched on translate.google.com. And at the same time, we also put out a multilingual uh, uh, paper, which describes our multilingual approach. So this is just a short um, summary of the development timeline. By the way, this was um, very fast for Google standards. And uh, usually, these things take much, much longer because um, uh, there are so many people involved. But we were lucky that we, we got this done um, quite quickly. So let me tell you about production traffic. Um, so currently, every day, billions of sentences are served by this system. And um, we launched in mid-November for 16 language pairs, eight languages. And currently, that means about eight, more than eight billion sentences per day. And that is more than 100,000 sentences per second, um, which is, of course, quite a bit. Um, so. Google Translate altogether for all 103 languages that we support um, translates about 140 billion words per day. And, um, and this is only the 8 billion sentences per day is only for the uh, neural machine translation system. So only for these eight languages. We are also the biggest users of TPUs at Google. TPUs are the um, tensor processing units, which you may have heard about. So Google built some chips, which are basically like a GPU card that can run um, um, any, any neural networks for inference very, very fast. So let's talk a little bit about production quality. So um, the, our system gives significant improvements. And the way to measure this is um, something that the Translate team came up with a long, long time ago. So we measure this using human side-by-side -side scores. A human side-by-side -side score improvement of 0 0.1 is significant. And um, an improvement of greater 0 0.1 means definitely launchable. And greater 0 0.1 would take many, many months to achieve in the previous system. So let me talk to you for a second of how these scores are calculated. So we have a... Um, we take a sentence and feed it through the old system and the new system. And then we send the results to uh, human raters. And the human raters have to rate uh, the results on a scale of 0 to 6. 0 meaning a very bad translation, and 6 meaning a perfect translation. And of course, anything in between. So if you send a large enough number of sentences to people, you can calculate an a good estimate for the average of the old system and greater 0 0.1, it means it is significant. So given this measure for our first language pair that we launched that was Chinese-English, it got a side-by-side -side score of uh, improvement of 0 0.6. And 0 0.6 was uh, very big compared to what we ever had before. So for this specific language pair, Chinese to English, 0 0.6 was the same improvement as what the Translate team had gotten for the last 10 years together in the old system. So this made obviously a big difference. Um, by now, uh, we have trained a lot of language pairs, and um, almost all language pairs have an improvement of greater 0 0.5. And some even have an improvement of greater 1.0 on this scale from 0 to 6. And this actually means um, a big improvement. So this basically moves some languages from completely unusable to usable. Uh, for example, Korean to English or um, 
Japanese to English improved um, a lot. So you may have seen this, um, uh, this chart here. So this is the relative error reduction on this scale of zero to six. And you see the phrase-based system, the old system in blue, our new neural system in green, and the human in yellow. So what is interesting about this chart is um, a few things. First of all, the neural system covers about, gets us about half um, between the human and the phrase-based system. So in, in some cases, in fact, a little bit better, but um, it's, it's definitely a significant improvement. But the other interesting thing about this chart is, is why is the human not at six? And um, the reason for that is, is uh, one reason is that translation is ambiguous, meaning um, if you give a long sentence, a long complicated sentence to somebody to translate and ask somebody else whether that is a good translation, the um, other person will not necessarily say that this is the best translation. So everybody has a slightly different uh, um, preference of how to translate. Another reason is, is that on average, humans um, cannot translate everything. If you take a complicated sentence out of uh, news or Wikipedia, it may contain words that the human doesn't know or doesn't understand correctly. And that's why he or she will not be able to generate a perfect translation. So let's look at one example. So this is from uh, Japanese English. Uh, somebody in Japan discovered this and um, discovered that we had launched a new system and was surprised that the uh, result was so good. So um, I'm not exactly sure what happened here to the font size, but uh, let's look at the um, at the last sentence. Well, this is first of all, this is a Hemingway original, and um, the. Um, the original last sentence says, unfortunately, some, something went wrong with the font here. No one has explained what the leopard was seeking at that altitude. So if we would have put that into the old system, the old system would have translated whether the leopard had what the demand at that altitude, there's no that nobody explains. So this does not make any sense. And um, the old system uh, had, had a lot of problems like this. So, by the way, how the, how the way how this was generated was that the, that the Japanese person translated the original to Japanese and then put it into the old system, his Japanese. So, for the new system, um, what we got was, and, and I'm, I'm um, sorry about the uh, problems with the font, so this didn't happen before. Um, but basically what happened here was, no one can explain what the leopard was seeking at that altitude. And there's only two errors in this whole um, uh, section of text here that, uh, that gives away the information that this is not a human translating this. And this was the missing a uh, and the missing the in the, um, in the result. So overall, this is a much better translation than what we had uh, seen before. Okay, so now let's go a little bit into the details of uh, sequence models. Um, so I'm not sure how much you know about sequence models. Some people may be experts, some people have never heard about them. But basically, recurrent neural sequence models have been, um, have been out there for a long, long time. So 20 years ago, people already used uh, recurrent sequence models. And um, recently, since about uh, six or seven years ago, people started using them for language modeling, which is a typical task. So basically, you have the, um, the unconditional probability of, of a sentence, and you, you want to estimate the, the total probability of the sentence. And the way to do this is that you um, decompose the probability into a product of uh, conditional probabilities. So a product, uh, the probability of y1 times the probability of y2 given y1 times the probability of y3 given y1, y2, and so on. 
So one typical application is uh, language modeling. And um, we wrote, we did a lot of research on this in the past. And uh, we have a paper that describes a state-of-the-art result on a public benchmark. And this paper is called Exploring the Limits of Language Modeling. So if you want to um, look at the details of how we exactly the, uh, we did this, uh, please look at this paper. The paper is basically exactly like the structure that you can see here, but um, is a little bit more complicated. But in spirit, it's exactly the same thing. So people always ask um, or are sometimes confused of how you decode with sequence models and what that exactly means. So um, decoding means to find the one best or the n best highest probability output sequences. And the way to do this is, for the one best is, you take your, uh, your best output and feed it into the next input and get another uh, best output and so on. So this would, be, this would be generating the first best hypothesis. But if you want to generate an n best, you have to do this many, many times. So for example, for the first one, you, have, you get the two best results and you feed those two best results in again, and then you get a total of four results. And then the next time you would get a total of eight results and so on. Um, so this, this grows at, uh, exponentially at every step. But the way to limit this is that you, um, you sort your new hypotheses by score and only pick the ones that are good enough and let's say you can, um, you can either prune by score or you can prune by the number. And a lot of people prune by the number. For example, they always cut it to 8 or 10 or whatever. And this is how you generate the best probability sequences. Another interesting thing that you can do is you can sample from sequence models. And this is a slightly different thing. It basically means to generate samples um, for your complete probability model. And the way this is done is you, um, you feed in uh, your, your, you start with your uh, sequence, you generate the first probability distribution P of Y1 here, and then sample from P of Y1 according to its probabilities, pick the output symbol that you, that you found and put that in as the next one. And in this way, go through the whole sentence until you are done. And in that way, if you, if you, if you can do this many, many times, and you get different samples uh, from, your, um, from your model. So for example, this would be used to generate random text from a um, language model, from a sequence model that was trained as a language model. So. Um, Let's go to some applications that we actually um, have used this for at Google. So, um, for example, speech recognition. Speech recognition is a very typical um, sequence model. And um, as outputs, we estimate uh, state posterior probabilities for each 10 milliseconds of audio input. And these state pro posterior probabilities you usually have about 10,000 of them for a normal speech system. But this So another interesting application is video recommendations. It sounds like a very different problem from language modeling or speech recognition, but again, the exact same model is used here or can be used here. So I worked on this a while ago. We were using a hierarchical softmax and a, and a uh, maximum entropy model for the um, top 500,000 YouTube videos. And um, let's assume you have seen an input sequence like this here. So this is what you watched. Battlestar Galactica and some nail videos. And um, the system would produce, just like a language model, it would produce the, the 10 best results. And the 10 best results, you see the best one here is Battlestar Galactica. And this would be episode five to six. And this is because you watched before episodes three and four. So, and then of course, you also see some nail videos here and some other Battlestar Galactica. So what is interesting about this is that 
There's nothing that the system knows about the user. The only thing it knows is the ID of the video. And, um, and the interesting part is that this is just a sequence model um, and, and basically the same model as a language model or um, a speech recognition um, acoustic model. So another interesting um, application of this is um, image captioning. So let's say um, you want to describe what an image um, contains. So uh, about two years ago, we tested this and also wrote a paper about it. And the paper is a neural image caption generator. Um, it's, it's a very interesting paper. But basically what is done here is you take an image classification model, uh, cut out the, um, the softmax at the end and just take the last vector that you have before the softmax and use that as your initial state for the recurrent neural network that you feed it into. And then you train it, your model, just like a um, language model. And what you get is that you can put in a picture and it generates a description of the picture. And in this case, it would generate a close-up of a child holding a stuffed animal, which I think is an excellent description of this picture. So here we see some um, examples of what our system got for some random uh, pictures. So here you see a man holding a tennis racket on a tennis court. Quite good. I mean, this is a complicated picture to describe. Two pizzas sitting on top of a to stove top oven. Also quite good. Or down here, a group of young people playing a game of frisbee. Yes. But then, of course, you have errors. A man flying through the air while riding a snowboard. So you see, um, it could be a man flying through the air while riding a snowboard, but it's, um, this is just a kite. And uh, this is, of course, an error. But still, it was quite interesting to see that a simple sequence model with the right input can do these tasks. So next, let's go to sequence to sequence models. So sequence to sequence models are just an extension of sequence models. With the only difference um, that we have now this pink part here, so the blue part is the same as what we had before. So now we have this additional pink part, and we call the additional pink part encoder, and the blue part now a decoder, although it's the same as a language model. Um, so what we, what we do here is the, the pink part is only there to encode the input sequence, the input sequence x1, x2, and as output, we would get y1, y2, y3, and then the end of sentence symbol. So um, as you can see, theoretically, this should work for any length of inputs and for any length of outputs. So for this, um, when this uh, model came out the first time, the people who did this um, got quite good results on this research benchmark database that I told you about. So the peop these guys, they didn't use the very simplest model that we just saw on the last slide. They already used a more complicated model with each of the boxes containing an LSTM instead of an RNN. And also they have four different layers here instead of just one layer. So this is a typical extension that we use for um, sequence to sequence models. And it made results much better. When we go, oh, here's, um, here's another uh, a slide, a, a small explanation of a trick. So this attention mechanism that I mentioned on one of the first slides, how does it actually work? Well, it addresses the information bottleneck problem. So now with the attention mechanism, you can access all encoder states instead of only the final one. And this is a great um, uh, advancement. So the way this is done is that you calculate a softmax over all of your inputs and assign a probability to each of the inputs, uh, each of the input states, which one is the most important. And then you calculate according to those probabilities, you cal calculate a weighted average of your states that you have at, at these points here. 
And this weighted average you use at each decoding step to guide your, your next um, output. And um, the reason why this is called attention is because this mechanism allows to attend to certain parts of the input that are more important than others. And of course, this is exactly what we expect because uh, for translation, we know that um, certain words map to certain words um, in, from the input to the output. And we don't have to see the whole sentence to translate one word. Okay. So this slide shows our new um, BNMT model architecture. And as you can see, it's just a, a bigger extension of what we uh, have seen before. So what you can see here um, is the number of key differences um, to, to, the, to the structures that I showed before. So first of all, there's a bidirectional first layer here. So meaning the, the system sees the sequence from the left and sees the sequence from the right. And um, those are run on two different GPU cards. Then, the, um, then they are concatenated and go into the next GPU layer and all the other layers are just unidirectional. So what you can also see here on the encoder is that there are skip connections, these ones here. And we call them residual connections. And those residual connections basically can skip over the whole layer, meaning that you can go from here to the end, uh, basically without going through the layer as well. And that is necessary to um, make the system converge faster. So what we see, oh, by the way, we have eight of these layers here, not just four. What we see on the... Um, Decoder side is very typical. This, this runs again on eight GPUs. Um, and in the middle, we have the attention mechanism. The attention mechanism gets fed from the, from the last layer of the encoder and from the first layer of the decoder. And the, the output gets fed to the next layer of uh, to all layers of the, of the next time step. So all these things are done uh, such that we can use maximum parallelism for these um, for these models, and we can use actually eight GPUs efficiently. Okay, so model training. We run um, one model training runs on about 100 GPUs, meaning on 12 different machines with um, eight GPUs each, and um, our output output vocabulary is only 32,000 and therefore it can be fully calculated. So there's no sampling or no hierarchical softmax. And why that is, I will explain to you in a second. So the optimization is just a combination of um, uh, stochastic gradient descent and ATOM, which is just a fancy um, stochastic gradient descent algorithm with delayed exponential decay. Um, we put 128 sentences, usually sometimes 256 sentence pairs into, into one batch. And we call this, it's run in one step. So the training time, it takes about one week for two and a half million steps on this architecture, which means it can roughly run through 300 million sentences. we cannot run through all data because on English French, we have about 2 billion sentence pairs, which we collected from the web and we use only 15% of all available data. So we don't even, um, and this is, of course, we see all that data only once. And um, so this is an interesting thing because um, people sometimes ask us, so how much data do you need to train your system? Do you need any more data? And um, in this case, we don't we can only afford to run through 15% and we, we get already much, much better results than before. So now we get to the, uh, to the part, um, why do we have only a um, output vocabulary of 32,000? So um, in translation, it's very important to be able to translate all words in some way. In the beginning, we had 160,000 words. 
and a very big soft max, which is slow to train and slow to um, evaluate. And also 160,000 words, uh, uh, they don't really cover everything. Depending on the language, the out of vocabulary rate is between three and 7%. For example, in Russian, because Russian uh, generates very long words, um, the out of vocabulary rate was about 7%. So this is very, very high with 160,000 words, and we needed to um, have a solution for this. So there are many, many tricks in the system, but this is just one of them that made it, uh, that was necessary to do to get a good result. So what we use is what we call a word piece model, which basically cuts every word into a small number of segments, into subword units, um, and we limit the number of subword units. So in the, in the simplest case, we would cut into characters. So characters are possible to use, but have some um, other disadvantages, which I show on a later slide. So we, we cut um, into units that are greater than characters. And basically this solves our unknown word problem because in the worst case we get characters, but um, what, what happens here is that this word piece model, with using this word piece model, we get frequent words become full units and rare words are split up. So the training criterion for this is maximum likelihood, a greedy procedure. And it's um, in this case, it's very uh, similar to byte pair encoding, which um, other people have called is a very similar technique. But um, we have had this for a long time. And uh, we have used this first for Japanese and Korean voice search. And uh, th there's a paper about this, this that describes this um, approach in more detail. So just here's an example. So what would happen is for segmentation, we would add underscore before the words and then segment it using a trained word piece model. So in this case, this is the house would be um, would be cut up into the is is a uh, house, and and these units would all map to different IDs, and then the desegmentation. What would come out of the decoder is you remove the spaces and then replace the underscore by space. For example, for this um, uh, token sequence, and you get back the original sentence. This is a house. So, um, what kind of effects did this model have? Well. It was particularly important for morphologically rich languages like Russian, German, Japanese, Korean. It made a big difference. For example, for Russian English and English Russian, our first results were actually negative and um, with a new system. But once we introduced this, uh, this word piece model, these subword units, we got a big improvement to English and, uh, and a still pretty big improvement from English to Russian. So now we model all languages uh, with this, um, with this uh, word piece model, and usually we use 32,000 um, outputs, sometimes 16,000 when that makes sense. So what is interesting is that this improves results, as we see here, but it also lowers the latency, meaning it makes, makes decoding faster. And we see this on this slide. Um, so this is a slide where we compare word, character, word piece, and a mixed word and character model. And uh, what is interesting about this slide is, we show, by the way, here blue score. Blue score is an automatic measure to, um, uh, to, to measure translation quality. And um, higher is better here. So for what you can see here is that the best model, the best results we get for a word piece model with 32,000 units and it's quite a lot better than, than just using words. And it's also better than using characters. So what is interesting about this here is that characters, um, the problem with characters is that you have a very small softmax, but you have much, much longer input and output sequences. And um, meaning that training and getting to a good point uh, for your, for your uh, local minimum takes a lot, lot longer. And in fact, we never got better results with this probably because of training uh, problems. What is also interesting is that the decoding time on, on the right side, you see that the, the fastest model was for our 16K uh, word piece model, and this was faster than for the word model, 
and also much faster than the character model. So here we see the problem with the character model because the sequences are longer, the decoding time uh, goes up a lot. Um, so why is the word piece model the fastest? Well, there is a um, balance between the size of the softmax, which is in this case only 16,000, and uh, the length of the sequences. So um, for words, you get uh, shorter sequences, but because your softmax is 160,000, this slows everything down a lot, while in this case we have only 16,000. So the softmax is much faster, and the slight increase in average sequence length doesn't matter here. So this is why we choose roughly, you know, either 16K or 32K now as our units. So now we, let's talk a little bit about TPUs. So TPU stands for Tensor Processing Units, and those are the hardware cards that I mentioned in the beginning. And um, they were very important for us because without them, we could not have launched. So decoding speed used to be a major launch blocker. And uh, we have about 300 million uh, model parameters in total. We had to deal with a lot of quantization error problems, with some bugs on the system, with many rich restrictions that these TPUs have, for example, limited memory and so on. But using the TPUs and using um, some better algorithms for our search, uh, better pruning algorithms, we cut down uh, the decoding time from 10 seconds per sentence to about 200 milliseconds per sentence within two months. And that was a, a very important step uh, to make this work because um, if a translation takes too long, you cannot launch and uh, because users will not use it. So what is also interesting about the TPUs and how we use the quantized models is that we had to make actually very few changes to use um, them as quantized models. So. For quantization, it's important that you limit the range of your um, neural network activations during training. So theoretically, they, they can go from minus infinity to infinity, but um, if you use a very high range, of course, you cannot uh, quantize your, um, your activations. And um, to be able to have a low quantization error, we had to limit the, uh, the range and we only limited the range uh, to eventually minus one to plus one, which seems like a very small range, but this was enough and this was good enough to get um, to train our models quantized and to get to good results. So eventually we just use um, uh, multiplications is only in eight bits. All other operations are 16 bits on this card. And um, the attention model module, because it needs a lot of memory, is still on CPU um, due to various restrictions of the uh, of the TPU card, um, especially memory. And overall, but this is what we what we did for the um, quantized models here. So what is also interesting is that quantization actually helps quality. And um, you see here the blue and the red curve. So the blue curve is for normal training and the red curve is for quantized training. It does not seem to make much of a difference. This is log perplexity against the number of um, steps. And um, after about 1.4 million steps, um, this, is, this is the end of it. And you see that the red is always slightly below the uh, blue curve here. So um, this is all. The old system was um, simpler in a way and therefore very fast. So we see the old system here in red and the blue system in blue for the latency that it takes to uh, decode sentences. And let's see, let's look for example at English to Portuguese. English to Portuguese was about 50 milliseconds before and now with the new system, with the TPU cards, it was 180 milliseconds or something like that. And the Translate team actually ran some tests. So how slow can you make the system such that users will not uh, complain? And basically they found anything below 400 milliseconds is, is fine for the user to not complain. They are still happy. So, and that was what allowed us to increase the latency a little bit for the new system because it, it was much more computation but still be in a range such that, such that the users would be happy. 
So for the new system, we got, you know, uh, it, it became slower than the old system, but it's still um, very much sufficient. So here's another interesting ch chart about uh, speed ups between GPU, CPU, and TPU. So in blue, we see um, GPU, and then the speed up factor of CPU versus GPU is about two here, and then the speed up factor between CPU and TPU is about four. And um, you wonder, may wonder why is GPU so slow here? Well, the biggest reason is that we did not optimize our decoder to run on GPUs. For GPUs, it only makes sense um, it only makes sense to use GPUs if you have a lot of parallel computation going on. And in this case, our batch size is actually one or a batch size of eight. This is not a lot of parallel computation that we need. And um, therefore, CPU was always faster than GPU. But what is most important here is that the TPU numbers were much better than the CPU numbers. And that's why we went uh, with, a, with a, uh, these cards, the TPUs in production. Okay, so let's talk about multilingual models. So the multilingual models, it means to model several language pairs in a single model. So we first ran those experiments in February 2016, and surprisingly this, this worked just for a simple way of um, translating English to French and French to English within the same system. So how does this work? Um, we prepend a source with an additional token to indicate the target language in the data only. So meaning if you want to translate how are you to Spanish, you just put this token in front of it, to ES meaning to Spanish, and feed that to the system, and out comes Spanish. In the same way, um, if you want to translate to English, you put this to EN token in there, and you get English. So if you amend your data like this, you can put any languages you want into your system and train it just like before. And the good thing was that this requires no changes to the model architecture, which are often hard to do when, when you talk to people who work on this. And it was extremely simple and effective. So this is usually with a shared uh, word piece model for the source and target languages. Okay, so let's go into some experiments that um, show what we can do with this. So let's say, so there are three different experiments here on this slide, and this is the first one. Let's say we train a system with English to Spanish and Spanish to English. So now if we train these systems separately, we get blue scores of 34.5 and 38. If we train a multilingual model, meaning both into the same system with the same number of parameters, we get actually a better result for English to Spanish and the slightly worse result here for uh, Spanish to English. But what is interesting is that although it uses the same number of parameters as one of the single models, it's possible to get actually better results in some cases. And here is here's what you, this is just the example from the, from the last slide as well. So now let's run another experiment. Let's say we train um, a system with English to Spanish and Portuguese to English. So again, we see similar um, uh, results for the single and, and multilingual models here. Sometimes it gets better, sometimes it gets a little worse. But what is interesting is now you can run a, um, another direction. You can actually translate Portuguese to Spanish. And for that, we get 20, a blue score of 23, which is not uh, by far not perfect, but it's better than nothing. And what that means is that you can use you can use this system to translate Portuguese to Spanish, although the system has never seen any data um, of that of that um, of that pairing. And we call this zero shot translation because um, it can translate languages that in that uh, setting it has never seen. So here's another result. If you add more of those languages, in this case, English to Spanish, Spanish to English, English to Portuguese, Portuguese to English, you get another set of numbers. Now we have four language pairs. And in this case, now we get for Portuguese to Spanish, we get actually an even better result. So this is surprising because um, now we have much more uh, we use the same size model and, and use um, basically what we used to have in four single models now in one, 
and we still get in some cases actually some better results as you can for example see here and we can do the zero shot translation for several directions in this case so um once we had these models we used them actually a lot so and here's an interesting example what you can do is you can do code switching even um, within a single sentence so for example if we have a Japanese and Korean to English model trained, we can put in a Japanese sentence and out comes English, of course. We can put in a Korean sentence and out comes English. But what, what we can also do with this is that we put in a mixed Japanese-Korean sentence because only the first part is Japanese, the second part is Korean. We can do this because a Japanese and Korean have very similar grammar structure and somebody would, who would speak both languages would understand actually this sentence, and the system can still translate this. And as you can see, it's translated slightly different, you know, off Tokyo University, but this is still a good translation. So another thing we can do is we can, um, somebody said, uh, what happens if we do a weighted target language selection? So what he meant was, we can, if we have a system that translate English to Japanese or Korean, we have two tokens that we need, the two Japanese token and the two Korean token. So what would happen if we put in a linear combination of those tokens? And the way we do this is we calculate the embedding that the Japanese token gets and the embedding that the Korean token gets and just linearly merge these two embeddings. So what happens here is if you put in this English sentence, for a Korean fact of zero, you get complete Japanese and a perfect sentence. For a Korean factor of one, you get a perfect Korean sentence. But in between, you slowly go to, from Japanese to Korean. And it's kind of interesting because sometimes even the script is mixed here. And the grammar, it becomes more and more Korean grammar, which is a very interesting um, effect. So we have in our paper actually a, um, a language with uh, an example with four different languages where we mix um, uh, Russian, Belarusian, and Ukrainian, and English. And um, for that example, it goes through, through another language in the middle when doing this. So this is a very interesting effect. So then uh, we looked at some, we, we were thinking that um, maybe there is some sign of a semantic representation in those models somewhere. So what we did was, we took um, a vector sequence out of the um, decoder uh, during decoding and mapped this 1,024-dimensional vector sequence down to a low-dimensional space, to a three-dimensional space, and this is a cut through a, um, as a, as a two-dimensional space here. And um, so then we, all these trajectories are sentences, basically. So then we looked at these, um, at these clusters that we get and for example, for this cluster that is that is here on the right, and if we color those um, individual sentences by um, uh, by the language they are translated to, so we have uh, yellow for English, blue for Korean, and red for Japanese here. So this is a, a model that can uh, translate between those languages. And what we see is that all these sentences have it, or have the same meaning. So what that means is that um, sentences with the same meaning are mapped to a very similar space within this model if the translation is good. And that gave us a... ...these models, um, which hopefully will help us a lot more in the future. So there's a lot more to do here, but this is an interesting result. So challenges. We have... Um, the translation is by far not perfect yet. Um, there is uh, early cutoff, so meaning sometimes it cuts off or drops some words in the source sentence. Then we have a lot of broken dates and numbers. So for example, five days ago becomes six days ago in Korean, which is really a, a silly mistake, but this is the system, uh, the system still makes mistakes like this. Um, but on average, the new system is significantly better than the previous system on number expressions. So finally, uh, not finally, short rare queries, like for example, DNA in Japanese, 
is something that should be very simple to translate because for humans, you just look it up in a dictionary, but the system cannot do this well yet. Transliteration of names is, is an important part, for example, for Russian as well. And uh, transliteration doesn't always work. And transliteration is uh, sometimes also hard to generate because you don't know whether you want to translate the word or you want to do a transliteration of it. And that is uh, very context dependent. So finally, we get a lot of junk in our data. So for example, we get Oxford Dictionary for random stuff if, when we translate to Chinese and, and we get some other things, um, some other artifacts. Which, is, which are all, um, uh, those are all because the data is very bad. Um, and we need, to, we need to find better ways to clean up our data. So finally, some open research problems. So use of context. Of course, we want to do full document translation. We want to do eventually streaming translation. This cannot be done yet, but hopefully will be done in, in the future. Uh, we want to use other modalities and features. Uh, so, for example, for a, an old person, you would maybe generate a different translation than for a kid. What we also need is better automatic measures and objective functions. So, the current blue score that we use weighs all words the same regardless of meaning. So, we have president uh, is the same, has the same weight as the word the, and usually the word president is much more important to translate. So, we need to fix that. Then discriminative training is an important part. Uh, we have already something that, um, that we have implemented and it works, it, imp it improves the scores, but unfortunately the improvement in scores does not really make a big difference in how humans see those um, results. So they, um, for humans, it's actually a significant difference is, is very hard to see. There needs to be a big jump in blue score to see a difference. So finally, a lot of the improvements that we have to do um, are just boring to do and, and people, you know, it's, it's not, they're not so, so interesting to do and that's why people usually don't do them. Many are incremental. So for example, we have to have data cleaning, we have to have uh, new test sets and so on. So BNMT is used for a lot of other projects at Google as well. So for example, for question answering systems, for chatbots, for um, summarization, for dialogue modeling, for generating questions from queries, and so on and so on and so on. There's a lot of ways how this system can be used for completely different problems because it's basically just mapping one token sequence to another token sequence. So finally, I have some resources. Um, so we are using TensorFlow, which is our own uh, neural network toolkit. TensorFlow.org contains all the details. Um, both of those two papers contain a full description of the system, uh, of our system. There was recently a New York Times Magazine article, which is called The Great AI Awakening, which uh, talks about a little bit about the, uh, the history of how this project was developed. And then finally, and uh, we have uh, three months internships that are possible. I'm not currently sure how possible they are for people from other countries, but you know, in case you are in the US, um, those are definitely possible. And then we have one year residency program and you maybe want to look this up under this, uh, under this um, uh, web address here. So this is, we do this once a year and people from all over the world come. And uh, so this is, if you're interested in, in, in um, neural networks a lot, or in machine learning, uh, consider this. This is a very interesting program uh, to get into. Okay, so I hope I didn't go too much over time. Uh, thank you very much. And um, yep. maybe we can um, ask some questions now. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so a round so of applause round for, for Mike. Mike. And, uh, and uh, one technical one detail, technical how we detail, would uh, we give questions to Mike. Uh, if you have a question, you have to come here. So hopefully Mike sees you. Uh, and uh, uh, he would definitely hear you well. Uh, by the way, Mike, could you turn on your uh, camera as the main source of signal? Yes. Mike Schuster. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, yep. Uh, so let's give our first uh, questioner. 
Um, Hello? Yes. So the question is, you did speak a little bit about the uh, quality metrics. And there has been a recent paper in the context of dialogue and conversational models where they basically found out that the blue metric does not really correlate well with uh, human gold standard evaluation. So what, what are the current ideas on how to tackle this? Okay, right. Um, so I've heard actually this uh, criticism a lot. So the blue metric is not a good measure for uh, machine translation. But you know what? In general, this is, um, this, is not, this is not really true. So first of all, the blue measure has been used for a long time. We know it's not perfect, but it's not a, a horrible measure. So meaning that when the blue score gets a lot better, uh, we know that the human um, evaluation will also get a lot better. So, but you are right to say that um, in the limit of uh, achieving human performance, the blue score is less and less useful. And um, we are working on some new measures. In fact, internally, we use some slightly different measures. But uh, basically, it's something that I said on the last few slides. We have to find a measure that weighs certain words more importantly than others. For example, president is more important than the word the. And sure. um, this is, this, I believe this can be done relatively sim uh, simply by, uh, by weighing the data in a way that, that uh, assigns some, some, uh, some score of importance to each word. And this can be done in the, in the measure itself, and this can be done for training. And I believe this will improve, uh, at least on the meaning level, will improve the translation a lot. Seems really straightforward, something like TFIDF weights or something. Exactly. I mean, inverse yeah. document frequency or something like that. But, you know, there has, this is just some research that has to be done. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, Mike. Um, hello. hello, Mike. Uh, my name is Mikhail. Uh, so here? Here? I can see you now. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see. I, 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 I see you, Mike. Uh, so uh, I have a kind of technical question. Uh, how many layers of LSTM we can efficiently stack using only residual connection trick? So we tried it with, um, I think, 12 and 16 as well. And uh, 12 and 16 still works. So because the residual connections allow to skip all, all the layers, basically, right? And uh, we do get better results with 12, and uh, but not better results with 16 yet. Um, and this is probably uh, because of training issues. It, theoretically, it should be better the more layers you use. But the uh, one problem that we ran in practically is the more layers you use, the, uh, the slower the system gets. And, you know, we just couldn't afford that. Thank you, Mike. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, do you think is there a way to integrate uh, maybe old school methods like knowledge bases and ontologies and uh, use them to power maybe um, last functions or uh, weigh the importance of words that you mentioned uh, or maybe use them uh, in some intermediate uh, state representation? Um, I heard that some of the people from Stanford and Percy Lang's uh, laboratory did something uh, on the border of deep learning and uh, those old school knowledge basis methods. Are there a way to use them right now? Do you think so? Um, okay, so in our old system, we had a lot of um, you know, additional information sources to translate. For example, we had a reordering module, we had a um, uh, semantic parsing, we had all kinds of things that helped translation. In the new system, all these methods currently are gone because uh, they, they didn't help uh, for now. But I believe in the future, people will figure out to put some of these things back because obviously they give us information that, that helps. And um, uh, in the, I think the easiest thing that we need to do first is what we talked about before is to basically find a way to weigh words and make them, you know, assign a, 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 
importance to them. And that is something that can easily be done in the neural network system only. But you know, other information, so currently it looks like that it does not help so much, at least in this system. People at Google have tried, you know, have to try to add semantic meanings and things like that. But so far that hasn't helped much. But in the future, why not? Thank you. Hello, Mike. Thanks for your talk. And uh, I have a question about, uh, have you tried to fit your models on some artificial languages like Esperanto language from Lord of the Rings? No, uh, that would be a very interesting thing to try. Um, you know, we, uh, so maybe there's nobody here yet who, who um, is into these things enough to try it, but this would be a very interesting thing to try for an intern, for example. We yeah. should try this. Yeah, or, or I you also know think what? so. You should try it. <laughs> and uh, it will be great to create some, or oh, modify uh, some artificial language with your models, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hello, Mike. Uh, thank you for being yes. here with us today. Um, my question is uh, this. Uh, have you considered to use some neural network tricks to improve uh, the speed of your model, such as neural legislation, or all, your, all what you considered was uh, uh, hardware and uh, some faster algorithms of implementation? Uh, yes. So speed is for, us a big, is for us a big issue. So we are actually already using distillation. I didn't describe it because this is something we, are, we have been doing just recently. Um, so. Distillation means a few different things, but it basically means to, to soft align your, um, your results and, and uh, it's, it, it definitely helps. So we, I believe that in the future, we will have much, much smaller models that do the same thing as what we do now. Um, you know, eventually, I think it's crazy to have to run through 300 million parameters for one word. We know that it, it should be much, much less, right? But for, for now, this is what we have, and you know, in the future, it will get better. Okay, thanks. Okay, and three more questions, and uh, hopefully that, that will be it. So, please proceed. Uh, uh -huh. Hello, uh, so, uh, uh, thank you for your, uh, so I have a question. Let's say we have some difficult case of translation when, for example, you have some concept in a source language, but you don't have this concept in a target language. And yes. uh, so, as, as I understand, phrase-based uh, translation system will fail and not give any uh, adequate result. And, uh, for example, a human trans translator will give uh, some uh, explanation of the concept. And what will happen if uh, we give what will happen uh, with, uh, in case of a new neural network? So um, this is a very difficult thing to answer right now. We have seen, um, usually those are, you know, like, like a short uh, phrases and things like that, that mean something very specific in a language. Those are very hard to think. And um, I believe in the, in the future this will work in some way. But uh, I haven't seen enough examples to really say that that it, it that the new system does this any better than the old system. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, Mike. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. So I wanted to ask about that word piece representations. You mentioned actually three approaches, like using words, using characters, then using uh, word piece representations. Uh, how exactly did you choose uh, so something like a range of uh, word representations from which you, by optimizing some metric, chose the best one? And another question, uh, didn't you try other approaches so like using a bag of three grams of characters or something like this? Uh, and do you think that uh, tinkering with this exact thing, word representation, can substantially affect uh, the quality of the model. Okay, so let's um, answer the last question first. Um, so it de basically depends on the uh, quality of the segmentation. Okay, so um, I believe, so we already know that what we are using is not the best way to segment a sentence. 
So there are better ways in terms of likelihood where you can, uh, they are slightly more complicated, but you can do this. Uh, so that means that if you change the measure a little bit and you would end up with the same number of tokens, you, um, the only thing that really happens is that you get slightly faster decoding because your, your sequences are slightly um, uh, shorter, but you do not get uh, better results. So this is what we found. I believe there's not much um, improvement that can be done with whatever method you choose how to, uh, how to segment this. We have not tried to use, uh, for example, um, uh, three pieces, uh, three characters at once, but I, I'm actually quite sure this would work quite well um, also. I'm, I think it may not work as well because the problem is that your sequences become longer uh, on average, and also you lose some of the meaning of the pieces when you when you put in just, uh, let's say you, you use just three characters and you may lose some uh, translation quality as well. Um, but that said, we know our measure is not the best, but it's at least one measure of how to how to do this. And you can look up in the paper how this is done. Okay, thank you very much. And the final question. Uh, hello, Mike. Thank you for your great presentation, first of all. Uh, my name is Mitri, and I have a question about multilingual model. When you do it, you usually take very similar languages and English. But what happens when you take, for example, French, English, and Japanese? Okay, so um, this, is a, this is a very interesting question. We, uh, we get this question a lot, in, uh, interestingly. So we first thought that um, we need to pair languages that are very similar. But we had actually somebody in Japan run a whole bunch of experiments with random languages uh, mixed. And it's, it seems that it does not matter much what you mix. So um, uh, this, this means that, of course, you cannot do this um, code switching within the input sentence because often that you cannot do that when, when the word order of the sentence is completely different. But in terms of the general capability of the model, it does not seem to matter much what languages you mix. Uh, so you mean uh, the model understands the actual meaning? Yes, it, it looks like it does that. But you know, we have to research more about that. Because it, it unfortunately takes us very long to train these models. You know, these multilingual models train four times as long as the other ones, because you have to, you have to use more data to train them. And uh, this is what limits the amount of experiments that we can do with this. Thanks. OK. OK, so let's once again uh, thank and give a round of applause to Mike. And especially for waking early in uh, California today specifically for us. So once nope. again, thanks, Mike. Hopefully, we'll thanks. see you sometime on one of the data fests, uh, hopefully. Okay. Uh, okay. And. Uh, have a nice day. Thanks a lot for sharing uh, the latest research with us today. And cheers. Bye bye. Yep. Cheers. <laughs>